Thank you for joining us for this uh, webinar on um, the Bahamas Coral Reef Report Card that we put out recently. Uh, I'm Craig Dahlgren. I'm the Executive Director of the Perry Institute for Marine Science. Um, and before we get started, just to cover a couple housekeeping things, um, please keep yourself on mute throughout uh, the webinar. Um, there will be some time at the end for question and answers. If you, as we go along, want to put your questions in the group chat, we'll just review them at the end um, so that you can get them out when you need to and not have to be thinking about them or remembering them during the, the rest of the talk. Um, so to get started, uh, we are very pleased that we were able to put out a coral reef report card based on uh, coral reef health assessments that we've done from 2015 to 2019 throughout the Bahamas. Um, this is the third coral reef report card that we've put out for the Bahamas. The first in 2014 was one specific to New Providence and Rose Island. Uh, in 2016, we put one out for all surveys, uh, coral reef health assessment surveys conducted in the Bahamas between 2011 and 2014. And then now we're updating that with data collected from 2015 to 2019. And before I talk about what the surveys were and how we did them and all that, I um, want to just uh, start at the end of the report card. For most of this talk, I'll be following through from beginning to end of the report card, but wanted to jump to the end here to just to say that um, even though this is a Perry Institute for Marine Science product, um, there were a lot of people involved in creating this report card. Um, there was funding or some other form of support from over 30 different organizations, um, most of which are shown here on this slide. Um, over a five-year period, we spent at least half a million dollars conducting surveys and processing data. Um, and the surveys were conducted by PIM staff, but we had a total of 55 people contributing data that went into the report card, uh, most in the form of in-water surveys, but there were some other uh, contributions as well. So what I'm going to talk about in the report card is uh, how the data was collected, how we used the data, how we came up with some uh, coral reef indicators of coral reef health for the Bahamas and applied those in the areas where we did surveys, uh, how we can use that data to inform coral reef management in the Bahamas, and then we'll also follow the report card and take a a deeper look into a few things. What are some of the most pressing threats to coral reefs in the Bahamas? Where are we seeing some success with conservation? And what are some of the challenges that we face moving forward? So I'll jump right into that and start with um, what data went into this report card. And it was predominantly using data collected uh, using the Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment or AGRA reef protocols. Um, this is a comprehensive reef assessment protocol. It's comprehensive in that it addresses not just the corals, but other aspects of reef health, looking at the benthic communities, what's growing on the seafloor and how healthy that is, looking at the fish assemblages and how balanced they are um, for providing uh, ecological benefits. And one of the key things about AGRA is that it's a standardized protocol that's used throughout the region. So we can compare not just reefs within the Bahamas, but we can compare our reefs in the Bahamas to reefs throughout the region and see how they compare, uh, see how they stack up. And we can also use the data uh, to look at reefs over time. So to get into the three different components of agri, the first is benthos, the seafloor, and what's growing on it. And this is assessed using what's called a point intercept method predominantly. So the diver uh, lays out a transect along the seafloor, it's 10 meters long, and every 10 centimeters along that transect, it's a weighted lead line, it's marked off and the diver has to, the surveyor has to, 
say what's growing underneath every point along that transect, 100 points per transect, and we try to do at least six of those transects per reef. Uh, in addition to doing that, the divers are using this uh, PVC quadrat, this 25 centimeters by 25 centimeters, to look at all the young corals, coral recruits that are four centimeters or smaller uh, inside that area at five positions along the transect line. Um, and then after that, the diver's looking for mobile invertebrates. So looking for lobster, conch, sea cucumbers, and most importantly, this little guy here, um, sea urchins. Uh, there's a separate set of coral uh, surveys going on on the reef that are the coral surveys. And these are using a similar 10 meter long transect, but in this case, in an area that is a meter wide, so half meter on either side of this transect line, this surveyor is recording what species of coral are present there, their length, width, and height of the coral colonies, uh, whether or not there's bleaching and what percentage of the colony is bleached, whether or not there's disease and which disease they're seeing, and if there's partial mortality. And that partial mortality is, uh, corals are not like people. You're not either dead or alive. They're more like trees where you could have a dead branch or a dead piece of the trunk. So with corals, we're looking at what percentage of the colony itself is alive, and what is dead and if it's recent death or if it's old death. So just to show you a little bit of what this transect looks like, um, from the benthic transect, the diver's recording what's growing underneath every one of these points. And you'll notice in a lot of cases, it's not coral. Um, it's crustose coral and algae, it's macroalgae, it's um, turf algae. In some cases it is coral, like over here all along that transect for a hundred of these points. Um, the people doing coral surveys are on a separate transect lines, looking at half meter again on either side, recording what the species of all these corals are, how big they are, what percentage of them is alive, what percentage is bleached, is there disease, um, and what disease is there. And we'll do at least, we try to do six benthic surveys and two coral surveys per reef. Uh, we also do fish surveys, and in the fish surveys, we're looking at most of the different species, identifying the fish to species. Uh, for species like parrotfish that uh, change sex and change color uh, as they grow, we're looking at terminal phase and initial phases separately. And then we're doing counts of the number of each species that occurs within a size class. So how many are from zero to five centimeters? How many are five to 10? How many 10 to 20 and so on? Uh, just to give you a taste of what the fish survey is like, the surveyor is swimming along a 30 meter transect in this case and counting fish a meter on either side of them. So a two meter wide by 30 meter long belt, uh, identifying all of these fish, estimating their size and counting how many are in each size class. And it can sometimes be very difficult as fish just tend to pop in and out, uh, counting all these little parrotfish, that big one that swam by, this angelfish there. Um, there's a lot to keep track of as you're swimming along counting data. So agri surveys really require a lot of ability, one as a diver and two, uh, a lot of scientific knowledge so you can rapidly record all this information as you're swimming along and try to get as many of these surveys done as possible per site. Um, if we look at the AGRA survey sites that we did from 2015 to 2019 that went into the report card, they're shown here. There was over 250 reefs that were surveyed. We tried to do most of the surveys in places where we didn't have any data recently within the past 20 years. Uh, so a lot of them were done along uh, Abaco, including the whole Northern Abaco Barrier Reef system, uh, Eleuthera, Cat Island, Conception Island, Long Island, Great Exuma in Mariah Harbor Key National Park, um, and out here around Ocean Key, south of Bimini. Uh, 
We also did a number of assessments in Andros, New Providence, Southern Abaco, and Grand Bahama where we already had data so we could look at the change in those reefs over time. And we'll present some of that here. So for <laughs> what we did with the data after we collected it is we had it uh, processed and analyzed according to six different unique indicators of reef health uh, that are shown here and then a seventh composite index which was averaging the other six. We'll get into each of those individually so I'm not going to spend time on them here but for each of these indicators then we came up with a grading system. Poor, impaired, fair, and good were the four different grades the reef could receive. And then we present the data in the report card uh, in this format where uh, in the center of the graph it says what island group that we're looking at, Berry Islands, uh, Abaco, Grand Bahama, how many sites were surveyed in that group, what the average score was for that island or island group, uh, in this case poor, and then around the edges the proportion of reefs that were poor, impaired, fair, or good, like a pie graph. So that's how we're going to present the data. To get started with this first index is the benthic index. And this is really one of the more fundamental basic ones, but one of the more important things to look at. Kind of like when you go to the doctor and the first thing they do is check your temperature. That's what the benthic index is. It'll really tell you right away if something's wrong or not. Um, might not give you a lot of detail, but it'll be that first check that we do. And this is based on the idea that coral reefs were made by corals. Um, up until maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago, um, they were dominated by corals, but then they started to decline. And as coral populations in yellow went down, seaweed took over the reef. So we've gone through a phase shift now. We're in the Bahamas. We typically have, uh, on average, 11.7% of the reef is coral, and the remaining 88 0.3% is something else, a lot of it being seaweed. So seaweeds have really taken over. Uh, more on some islands than others, but in general, seaweeds have taken over. So the benthic index is looking at the ratio of corals and other positive organisms like crustose coral and algae and things that promote reef growth, that cement reefs together and allow corals to grow, and seaweeds and other things that have a negative impact on reef development. Um, cyanobacteria, uh, some of the uh, turf algaes that form sediment mats, um, and a number of other things. Uh, invertebrate sponges that bore into corals or overgrow corals. So comparing the ratio of positive things to negative things, we have this benthic index. And what it's telling us is that there's a, a pretty broad range throughout the Bahamas. We have uh, a lot of reefs that are in fair condition, a lot that are impaired condition, and only a, a smaller percentage that are poor condition. And Eleuthera is the only one that had the whole island be rated as poor for the benthic index. Um, but in a lot of these places, we still had some standout reefs. Even though Abaco was rated as impaired overall, the two reefs with the most percent cover of live coral, 50% of the reef was healthy live coral, was an Abaco, Mermaid Reef, which was off of Marsh Harbor, and Sandy Key Reef, which is uh, in the Pelican Keys Land and Sea Park. So these were the two that had the highest, by far, percentage of live coral. And we'll talk about those reefs a little bit later. Um, there was also this reef, which is the same reef that I showed in the video of the benthic transect with high coral diversity, high coral cover, and large colonies of coral. And this was at a place called John Miller's Blue Hole, or Jake's Hole, off of South Eleuthera. And then we had reefs like this one in the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park. Um, this is, happens to be Jeep Reef, but a number of reefs in the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park were rated as good. So the park protection does appear to be having a positive influence on the benthic index, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later too. So even though we have reefs in okay, not great condition, we still do have these hope spots that are real standout reefs. 
So that's kind of the most basic, but one of the most important indicators to look at. We also want to take a little bit of a deeper look into things. So we came up with the coral condition index, and this is looking at individual coral colonies. And like I said, they can die off. Part of the colony can die off and the rest can still survive. So what we're looking at here is the percentage, the average percentage of live coral tissue on colonies at each site, uh, on colonies that are bigger than 25 centimeters. Uh, and what we're seeing here is that this may be recent mortality causing it, it may be old mortality, it may be a colony that died off and had only these small pockets that are starting to regrow and will eventually fuse together again. But it kind of gives us a little bit of idea of the history of damage to that reef, the colonies on that reef. And what we found was a little bit more encouraging than the benthic index in this case. We had about uh, half the sites being rated as good they had a uh, mostly good percentage of live coral <coughs> averaged on each colony, but we still do have some trouble areas. In Grand Bahama, for example, 70% of the corals had high partial mortality. Uh, in Nassau, um, over 44% was, uh, only about 44% was live coral tissue. So the majority of the colonies there had died off. Um, the majority of each colony rather had died off on average. And what we're seeing is that this was due to all kinds of different impacts, uh, direct physical impacts like corals that had been dislodged or somehow damaged, corals that were infected with disease and were dying off, corals that were being preyed upon by various predators ranging from fish to these predatory snails that are voracious predators of coral and can kill colonies rapidly. And also coral bleaching, and this is a, a coral colony, a Musa angulosa is the species um, from southern Abaco. In 2015, when there was a mass bleaching event that we'll talk about in a little bit, this is that same colony the next year, and you can see that only a few of these big polyps that it has survived, the rest of these that were more bleached died off that year. So there's a lot of things that can cause coral condition to decline, but diseases uh, are one of the big ones. So we took a little deeper look at coral disease and have a coral disease index. And where the condition index integrates whatever's happened to that colony over the history of its life, the coral disease index looks at what's happening to colonies now. And we see typically in the Bahamas and throughout the Caribbean about a dozen or so different diseases. Some of them can be fairly benign, like these uh, tumors or growth anomalies that might kill off a little section of the coral, but generally don't kill the whole colony. Uh, dark spot disease, which affects a couple of species and again, can kill off partially the colony, but usually not the whole colony. And then we have some more aggressive diseases like black band disease, white plague disease, and white band disease. And these diseases can kill whole colonies. In fact, this white band disease, um, practically wiped out elkhorn and staghorn coral from the Caribbean um, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and as a result, those two species are some of the most critically endangered we have in the Bahamas. So what were we seeing with respect to disease on the reefs from 2015 to 2019? Uh, well, we see that uh, only 1.2% of all corals that we surveyed, and there were tens if not hundreds of thousands, uh, were showing signs of disease. So most of the reefs came out as being rated as pretty fair with a lot of reefs um, rated as good, particularly again, Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, but also some of these other sites. Uh, also, we found that Elkhorn coral, which had been nearly wiped out by this white band disease, we found uh, just a little more than 3% of the number of colonies surveyed had white band disease on them. So the disease is still present, but it's not having the dramatic impact that it had earlier when populations were much larger. All this is really good news, with the exception that all of this was from 2015 to 2019. But in 2020, we found a new coral disease, a stony coral tissue loss disease that is a very virulent disease and causes a major threat to reefs. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but prior to that, reefs looked like they were in pretty good shape with respect to disease. 
So if coral disease is looking at one of the big present threats to corals, we wanted to look and see what um, the future projection is for reefs. And to do that, we're looking at a recruitment index. And this is a way of looking at how many juvenile corals are, uh, are recruiting to reefs, are starting to enter the population. Um, and it, corals, it's relying on uh, sexual reproduction of corals. That's one of the ways that corals reproduce. Uh, spawning corals release egg and sperm, usually right around this time of year or into September over just a couple nights. Uh, each species will spawn synchronously on a reef and release egg and sperm together. Now this is a great strategy for getting mass amounts of eggs fertilized when you have healthy coral populations and they're densely packed together. Um, the eggs and sperm are released in the water and they rely on just mixing in the water to bring egg and sperm together for fertilization. As we see corals die off, however, uh, they're spaced farther apart and there's less of that fertilization that may be occurring. So already they're kind of up against a, a bit of a, a difficult situation. After a period of fertilization and embryogenesis, larvae swim around for a period of days to weeks, um, carried largely by currents, but they can swim until they're ready to settle to the seafloor. And they need to find a place where there's pink crustose coral and algae growing or just a biofilm with mostly bare space to really form an attachment to the reef. Uh, what we see though, if you remember back to the benthic index, is that reefs are increasingly being overgrown by seaweeds. And what that means is that there's less space for these guys to find a clean place to settle. And even if they do, there's a good chance of them being overgrown by algae and smothered basically before they really even have a chance to get started. Um, so by the time we see them when they're one to four centimeters, they're usually pretty well established at that point, but they've gone through two bottlenecks in the population already. So uh, we're seeing far fewer recruits than, uh, than we should be seeing in healthy conditions. And that's reflected in the recruitment index, which looks at uh, the density of recruits in those little squares that we see. And this is where things look pretty bad. We have a number of reefs uh, throughout the Bahamas in poor condition with some islands rated poor overall, uh, a lot of other islands rated as just uh, impaired overall, and some of the high points are, are the fair reefs. Um, what we're seeing here is that 40% of all the surveys that we've done looking for recruits had zero recruits in them. Um, so only 60% of the area that we were looking at had any kind of coral recruits. And 64% of those recruits, 23,000 or something like that, 64% were one genus of coral, um, parietes, and that includes parietes astreoides, uh, mustard hill coral is the common name of this green stuff here, and then finger coral, parietes parietes, parietes fricata, parietes divericata. Well, that's okay, I guess. I mean, at least these are recruiting, but the issue is that the corals that are dying off are these big massive colonies, the big brain corals, the boulder corals, the star corals, even some of the big elkhorn corals and big patches of staghorn coral. Um, but what we're seeing is those are being lost and they're not being replaced. What is coming in to replace them are these weedy species that really don't contribute as much to reef growth. So we're losing the old growth and just gaining these little bushy weedy species coming in. So we're going through a fundamental change in the coral communities, uh, as well as a shift to being algal dominated, it appears. So why is that? Well, uh, if you remember back, uh, one of the main things that's preventing recruitment is algal overgrowth. One of the ways to control that, the primary way to control that, is through grazing. And the main grazing species on Caribbean reefs is this guy, the long spine sea urchin, Diadema antelarum. The problem is that Diadema antelarum died off in the Caribbean back in 1982 to 1983. Uh, they used to be very common, were all over the place grazing on algae, grazing on seaweeds. But now in the Bahamas, even after 30 plus years, 
our densities are 10 to 100 times lower than they were before the die-off. So while these guys might be present and they might be making a comeback in some places, they're really not doing their job on Bahamian reefs. There's just not enough of them to graze down the algae. So what we're left with are parrotfish as the main grazers. And it's not all parrotfish. Uh, there's been some recent work looking at parrotfish grazing, and it seems that there's four key species all belonging to the genus Sparasoma that are responsible for most of the grazing on Caribbean reefs. Um, the red band parrotfish, stoplight parrotfish, red tail, and yellow tail parrotfish. So this index looks at the biomass of those key species, uh, biomass per unit area. And parrotfish uh, populations turn out to be generally fairly healthy throughout most of the Bahamas. There are some places, notably Eleuthera and New Providence, where we do see uh, impaired populations, a lot of sites that have poor parrotfish populations. But by and large, on average, they're pretty good. They're very variable, even within a reef, uh, within an island rather, but um, in the fair to good range. And that's probably because parrotfish really aren't thought of as a traditional uh, fishery species in the Bahamas. Um, that's changing, however, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes about how that's changing. Another key fish that we wanted to look at was grouper, um, the large grouper species, Nassau grouper, black grouper, tiger grouper. So we have a grouper index. Um, these are not only of economic importance as fishery species, but they play a key ecological role, keeping uh, fish and invertebrates populations that they prey on in check. Um, many of these species like three spot damselfish that have a negative impact on corals. So we really wanted to see what populations look like for these larger grouper species. So we looked at the density of these um, grouper populations in our surveys and we gave more weight to the larger fish. Uh, Nassau grouper, black grouper, they don't reproduce until they reach at least 50 centimeters. Um, about two feet long or so. So we're really um, only concerned with the big ones as reproductive in uh, population. Those are also the ones that are consuming more of the prey than others. And what we found when we looked at grouper was that the grouper populations are pretty good in the Bahamas still. Um, we tried using this grouper index with data from other parts of the Caribbean and everything came out to be poor. Um, so really Bahamas is one of the few places where we can use the index. And within the Bahamas, we still have a lot of reefs that have good grouper populations, particularly in protected areas like the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, like Conception Island National Park, but other places as well. When we look deeper at the grouper data though, we can look at things over time from the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park where we have a 20 year data set and we can see declines in Nassau grouper populations there. Why is that even though they're protected? And what we're seeing is that even though the populations are pretty good now, they used to be much better. And what we think is happening is the fish leave the park to spawn. They migrate out of the park, spawn, in the case of the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, they're spawning off a Long Island primarily. They'll migrate 100 miles. That's more than any protected area can contain them in the Bahamas. And for much of the past couple decades, there has not been a close, consistent closed season on Nassau grouper. So they leave the park and they're caught in the fishery. Even now that there is a closed season, they leave the park and there's high poaching rates at some of these spawning aggregation sites. So it just highlights the need for integrated management that includes both protected areas and fisheries management that's effectively enforced to protect these species. And for some, like Nassau grouper, it's critical. Not only are these important fishery species, but they're also critically endangered as well. So those are the six different indicators that we looked at. Some good, some bad. Um, when we combine all these and find out the average for every reef that we've surveyed in the Bahamas, and then average those reefs per island, we see that most islands, two thirds of the islands come out as being in fair condition and the other third impaired. Um, 
So it, it's not a bad situation. There were very few reefs, I think only about 3% that came out as being poor. But the other important thing to note that as of the good reefs, of the ones shown in blue, 60% of those reefs were in marine protected areas. So the protected areas are working, like the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park and Conception Island Park, but also smaller ones like the ones off of Andros and other places. <coughs> so this is um, a, a fairly positive, I would say. The, the reefs definitely are not what they were, but they're not without hope either. And there's some definite positive things going on on our reefs. So the next thing we're looking at are some case studies, looking at what some of the main threats are currently to reefs in the Bahamas, where we've seen some successful conservation and management, and what are the future challenges that these reefs face. And one of the first threats we looked at was the threat of hurricanes. Um, and this is looking specifically at Hurricane Dorian. We were fortunate uh, if you could say that word fortunate associated with Hurricane Dorian. But we had been collecting data from 70 reefs around Abaco and Grand Bahama in the months leading up to Hurricane Dorian, um, up to about a month before the hurricane hit. Uh, after it hit, about six weeks later, we got out and were able to reassess 30 or so of these sites. And we have the damage summarized here with yellow being mild damage, orange moderate, red severe damage. And what we see is that there was all kinds of damage to these reefs, broken and dislodged corals, burial uh, in sand, sand blasting that removed live tissue from corals, man-made debris from houses, cars, boats, um, natural debris, whole casuarina trees uprooted from the beach and rolled out across the reef. Uh, steamrolling everything in their path. And then we had coral bleaching. Um, and I've given talks about this before, so I won't go into too much detail, but some of the hardest hit sites were shallow reefs very close to the track of the storm. Um, but we did see others like this one over here that uh, was damaged in spite of being one of the farthest away from the, the track of the storm. And what we see there is that that reef was buried in sand that had been blown across the banks and just piled onto the reef, smothering the corals there. Um, other reefs were just badly damaged by debris like casuarina trees. So the damage really was variable across uh, the whole little Bahama bank. But hurricanes in general, not just something the scale of Dorian, but ones like Matthew and Irma <coughs> and Joaquin and others can cause severe damage. Another threat to coral reefs, looking at a more global scale, is climate change. And what we're mostly concerned about, even though climate change does contribute to hurricane damage, what we're most concerned about is the effect that climate change has on raising seawater temperatures, causing corals to bleach and then to die. They bleach, they expel the symbiotic microalgae, the zooxanthellae that live in their tissue, and they can then die if that's severe enough. In looking at all the data that we collected from 2015 to 2019, we broke it down to cold months shown in blue, January up to July when water temperatures start to approach bleaching thresholds, and then August to September when corals are at bleaching temperatures. Sometimes in August, September, they start to cool off in October, but you still can see bleaching because it persists over time. And what we found was there are seasonal differences, but it was alarming to see that 15 to 25 percent on average of corals bleached annually during this time period. It used to be that they would only have bleaching every once in a while, but this annual bleaching is a big concern. We also see that uh, in 2015 was a global mass bleaching event and the Bahamas got hit hard. Uh, in our surveys, almost 70 percent of all the corals we observed during that August to December timeframe were bleached. But the bleaching varied a lot around the Bahamas. And in November of 2015, we did surveys of some reefs in Southern Abaco and in Northern and Central Andros. And we see that the results were pretty different. Um, in Northern and Central Andros, most of the reefs were, uh, all of the reefs were over 50% bleached corals. Some reefs, 
over 75% shown in red, with a few of these approaching 100% of the corals on the reef were bleached. I think 97% was the highest that we saw. Uh, in Southern Abaco, on the other hand, we did see elevated bleaching rates, um, but they were typically in the 40 to 50% range with only one reef above 50%. So it can vary a lot from place to place. We see this on a very small scale, um, looking at some reefs off of Abaco that we had in a recent paper. Uh, these are two of the reefs that I mentioned before. Um, ah, uh, I don't know why I'm totally losing control. Let me just pause this. Um, two of the reefs that I mentioned before that had some of the highest coral cover in the Bahamas, um, Mermaid Reef and Sandy Key Reef. And what we see is that on Mermaid Reef, water temperature during that peak bleaching period from July to October, of 2015, temperatures approach 33 degrees Celsius. Uh, bleaching threshold, if you consider it to be around 30 degrees, it was over 30 degrees for almost the entire summer. Uh, Sandy Key Reef, however, it got up above 30 periodically, um, peaked out at close to 32 degrees, but it really didn't get much warmer than that. But what we saw was that the response of these reefs was very different with uh, reefs, um, Sandy Key Reef having the lower temperatures but showing the greater bleaching response. Hold on. Um, Sandy Key Reef bleached, Mermaid Reef didn't, is the bottom line, even though Mermaid Reef had much higher temperatures. So we dug a little deeper into this to see why that might be. And we looked at the genetics of the corals at Mermaid Reef and Sandy Key Reef. And we looked at the zooxanthellae, the symbionic algae that's in those corals. And what we found at Sandy Key Reef was that there was high genetic diversity. Most of the colonies sampled were unique colonies genetically. Uh, there was only one case where there were clones of each other that were sampled. On Mermaid Reef, however, we saw all the corals on that whole reef that were sampled were clones of each other. So there might be something within that specific genotype that makes them genetically predisposed to tolerate these big thermal temperature swings. And there was just a paper I saw today actually that came out showing this in other species of coral. This is in uh, Orbicella fabulata. Um, there was another species in the Caribbean that was shown to have a temperature tolerance gene. And it could be that these corals at Mermaid Reef have that. The other thing we found was that we see a uh, high diversity in the gene, the genera of zooxanthellae found in the reefs at Sandy Key Reef, whereas Mermaid Reef only had Durastinium, which is the most thermally tolerant of all the zooxanthellae. So it could be the coral, it could be the symbiont living within the coral that gives this coral at Mermaid Reef their, their superpowers, able to survive these um, high temperature ranges. So what we're now looking at is, can we use that to our advantage? Can we selectively cross uh, fertilization between corals of the same species from Sandy Key and Mermaid Reef to maybe develop uh, some strains that have that uh, more genetically diverse but still have that gene or the symbiodinium that allow them to survive through that temperature range. So it can help inform our restoration efforts. Another threat that we looked at going from the, the global threat of climate change down to the most local of threats here is coastal development. Um, this is looking at the change in coral cover, percent cover of live coral on reefs from 2011 to 2019, with the green colors showing an increase in coral cover and the red showing a decrease, the orange and red showing a decrease. Yellow was kind of neutral. What we found here was that we saw locally some severe decreases in coral cover, and we think this is related to coastal development. The site that had the greatest decrease in coral cover, 
lost almost 70% of its coral, went down from about 17% live coral cover, so well above average, to 5%, well below average, uh, was a reef called Nari Nari, which is right off of Clifton Pier. And if you can remember back to 2014, 2015, 2016, there was chronic petroleum leak from uh, petroleum storage on land into the water here. And that caused one, toxic chemicals to be released that can kill corals. Two, it led to blooms of cyanobacteria and other harmful things that can kill corals. Um, so that reef declined precipitously, most likely because of that oil spill. It was the closest reef to that uh, spill, that leak. This other site along the north coast had a 45% loss in coral, so pretty significant. Um, some of these other ones actually approached that, but this one was a little bit higher. And we don't have a, a clear smoking gun for this, but this is an area of New Providence that's seen high development rates uh, in the past decade or more, um, which is, leads to increased sedimentation, which leads to increase uh, runoff from land, which leads to increase uh, influx of nutrients from uh, wastewater disposal, things like that. So it might just be that uh, this one saw acute uh, uh, threat and the other one saw chronic threat. And this was not limited just to New Providence. We saw this throughout our surveys in areas where there was development. We saw some decreases, not all the places by development, but a lot of them. Another example is Ocean Key, which um, south of Cat Key, was a sand mining operation for decades, now is being converted to a cruise ship destination. Um, within three miles of that key, we had very low coral cover. That was only half the amount of the coral cover um, uh, up to six miles away. So really we think that it's sedimentation from all the years of sand mining that has caused the decline in those reefs. We'll see if they recover now that that has ceased and been cleaned up a little bit. Uh, we also see that for reefs that were in the remote areas, Conception Island, where there's no population, Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, where there's very minimal development, they had a lot more coral cover, 50 to 75 percent more on average than other reefs in the Bahamas. Moving on to the next threat, um, and this is probably the greatest immediate threat facing corals in the Bahamas right now, and that's stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, if you remember back, our disease index was looking pretty good. Only 1.2% of corals had diseases from 2015 to 2019. But then in March of 2020, we went out and did assessments of reports of stony coral tissue loss disease off Grand Bahama, and we found a widespread outbreak of stony coral tissue loss disease across a good half of the southern coast of Grand Bahama, and it was very prevalent for Symmetrical brain coral, this major reef building species, 80% uh, of all the colonies that we saw were either dead from stony coral tissue loss disease or were infected with stony coral tissue loss disease. And on this graph, the red is showing dead percentage for this species, orange is showing infected, green is showing healthy. And you can see that the red is increased right around the port area where we think it was introduced in ballast water from ships. Um, and as you spread out from there, uh, the situation gets a little better, but still most of the corals are infected and are likely to die. This is a very serious threat in terms of a disease. It's highly infectious. Think infectious, more infectious than, than COVID is in people, but much more deadly. It kills about 80% of this corals that get infected. So think something along the lines of Ebola or another serious disease. Uh, it can kill corals that took hundreds of years to grow. In Florida, there's a one well-known coral that they dated to be over 300 years old. It died in a matter of weeks when it got infected with this disease. Um, another problem is we don't have a cure for it because we don't even know what causes it yet. We know it's a pathogen that's in the water, it's transported in the water, but we don't know what the pathogen is. But that waterborne transport has led it in Florida to spread about 92 meters per day through the Florida reef track. So in four years, it's pretty much infected over 90% of the Florida reef track. 
It's not all bad news though. Uh, we do know that we can stop or slow the spread of the disease. Um, kind of like what we're doing, trying to do at least with COVID and people, with social distancing, face masks, reduce the transmission from one coral to another. Now we're not going to be able to reduce the transmission through natural ocean currents, but because it's waterborne, when you go diving in a spot with this disease, your gear is wet, it might be carrying the pathogen to the next place you go diving. When your boat takes on uh, water in its bilge from one site, it could be carrying it to the next site and pumping it out. When a ship uh, takes in ballast water from one place, if it's infected, it could be transporting it to another site. And that's the way we think it got to the Bahamas. We have it in Grand Bahama now, we have it in around Nassau now, two of the busiest port areas that are not connected to each other and not connected directly to Florida without some stepping stones in between that we don't have the disease yet as far as we know. So by limiting the spread through waterborne transport, we can reduce the spread. We can also treat individuals like if you are infected with COVID, you can go to the hospital and get treated and survive. We can treat corals with antibiotics. It's just that it's very expensive, very time consuming, and there's thousands of corals on a reef that are infected. We can't do everything. So um, this is a kind of last resort to save some of the more vulnerable species, some of the more important coral colonies, um, but we can do a response. The last threat then that I'm going to talk about is unregulated fishing, specifically for parrotfish. And if you remember back uh, to the previous slides about parrotfish, we are seeing some places like around Nassau where there's low parrotfish populations. So I was interested in looking at how populations there have changed from 2019 or 2011 to 2019 rather. And the color coding shows in green where populations have increased, in the oranges and red where populations have decreased. And what we see is all but one site have seen, or one or two sites have seen a decrease in the population. On average, there was a 40% decrease in parrotfish biomass around New Providence from 2011 to 2019. And in looking at this a little more, this isn't surprising. Uh, Carlisa Callwood did socioeconomic surveys of fishermen and 64% of fishermen reported harvesting parrotfish and 28% reported catching them every time they go out. And the species that they're catching tend to be the important ones for grazing. I put a red line next to the grazing ones, especially for New Providence and Eleuthera. So it's not surprising that these two sites are, were some of the lowest parrotfish index sites uh, island-wide. And these also have some of the higher amounts of algal biomass uh, or lower benthic index as well. So we can see a direct link between fishing for parrotfish, parrotfish populations, and then to their impact on reefs. So that's all kind of bad news. I wanted to end some more positive, um, and I'll talk some about some of the successes we've seen. And one of them is coral restoration. Uh, so starting in 2008, around this area here, we began growing uh, elkhorn and staghorn corals, two of the most endangered coral species in the Bahamas in nurseries and outplanting them to reefs. Uh, over the past 10, 11, 12 years since then, we've expanded this uh, network with our reef rescue network to include about 25 sites around the Bahamas where we're growing coral, uh, which is great. But what we can say from this is that we have measured in our surveys a positive impact that this has had on reefs. Uh, only 7% of sites that we surveyed had staghorn or elkhorn coral in the Bahamas. It's that rare now. But one third of those sites were our restoration sites where we have been repopulating them, where they've died off in the past and we're repopulating them now. Uh, the only sites that we saw that had an increase from 2011 to present in uh, Elkhorn and Staghorn populations were our restoration sites. And we have no, we've saved at least five genotypes that the wild populations, the wild colonies have died off from bleaching and disease. 
but we've saved them through our nursery and restoration efforts. So if you look at coral restoration, maybe not as a way of restoring a reef to what it once was, maybe rehabilitating it, um, but looking at it as a species survival plan where we can captively, not breed, but captively maintain populations and increase them uh, for these critically endangered species, similar to what they do for orangutans and tigers and elephants and things like that. Um, another major success is the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park. And this is uh, an example of an effective marine protected area in the Bahamas. And there's a, been a number of studies on it related to grouper, conch, and lobster. But we've, what we've seen in our surveys is that when we compare the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park to the rest of the Bahamas, there's much greater density of Nassau grouper and black grouper than other uh, areas and a tremendous increase in biomass. So we're getting more individuals and they're growing to larger sizes in the Exuma Park than other places. Um, we also see that there's a trickle down effect on the ecosystem where coral cover there is 76% greater on average than other parts of the Bahamas as well. So it does appear that the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park is a good example of protecting fishery species and ecosystem function. And based on that success and the success of other protected areas, the Bahamas has agreed to increase its protected area network from covering uh, the existing network that occupies about 10% of the nearshore waters of the Bahamas to one that includes 20%. So doubling the size of the protected areas and it's supposed to happen this year. Whether it will or not, we'll see, but that was the plan. But it's important to think about how decisions are made to where we should allow development and where we should create protected areas. We have to take into account the balance between ecological factors and social and economic considerations. So the healthiest areas aren't all, even though we're doing all these surveys to see where the healthiest areas are, these aren't necessarily the ones that get proposed for protection. And we can look at Eleuthera as a case study. And for Eleuthera, there's no marine protected areas at present. There's nine proposed, six of which include some reef area. And I've kind of outlined the general area where they occur here. I don't have the exact uh, shape files loaded in, but you can see where they're generally occurring or where they're proposed rather. There's also development proposed or ongoing in Eleuthera, including up here at Harbor Island, uh, throughout central Eleuther, there's small developments and there's uh, Lighthouse Point down here where a cruise line is proposed to, to develop that to a port. So we're faced with some tough decisions in balancing protection and development. Uh, and while we look at the protected side, there are some areas that do include some high priority areas like this reef here. Uh, that had the, some of the highest amount of Elkhorn coral that we've measured in the Bahamas. Most of them ended up being based on stakeholder input in areas of fairly low reef quality, both in terms of looking at percent coral cover here or uh, fish biomass. Um, proposed protected area around Lighthouse Point as a case in point had some of the lower uh, amounts of fish biomass for grouper, snapper, and grunt species. Same with this area here off of Savannah Sound in central part of Eleuthera, where we see some of the healthiest reefs and the greatest fish biomass is closer here to Cape Eleuthera. This site here has some of the, it has the most staghorn coral, critically endangered staghorn coral that we've seen in the Bahamas. This site here is that John Miller's Blue Hole, which has 34% live coral cover and some of the highest coral diversity that we've seen, both of which are not included in protected areas. So when we're coming up with these uh, decisions on what to do, we need to take into account the ecological information as a piece of the puzzle in addition to the social and economic information. Um, you know, there's no easy answer, uh, but all we can do is look at the data and try to incorporate the facts as best we can into the decisions that we make, realizing what the consequences are for those decisions. And finally, the report card looks at um, what people can do 
to help. And there's a number of things the report card outlines that people can do on an individual basis to eat sustainable seafood, dispose of wastewater properly, conserve energy to reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, for boaters, divers, fishermen, um, being careful of where you anchor away from reefs, not dumping chemicals into the water or using bleach for fishing, maintaining your vessel so that it's not leaking oil. As a community, there's ways that we can clean up, restore, and support the businesses that um, do uh, use sustainable practices. And then as a country, supporting the creation of marine protected areas, pushing for improved fishery management and supporting sustainable development measures are all key uh, pieces of the puzzle. And then finally, it's not in the report card, but we do have this issue of stony coral tissue loss disease. So we need to uh, try to stop the spread. And if you do see it, we have mechanisms through our website through apps that Best Commission has and other ways to report the sightings so that we can go out and see what the situation is and try to develop a, a strategy for managing the disease in that area. And I'll end here just putting up, uh, we have a number of resources available, including a copy of the report card that you can download, a website where you can report stony coral tissue loss disease, and always please feel free to contact me if you do have any questions. Um, with respect to coral reefs in the Bahamas in general or this report card specifically.